Hello everyone, uh, welcome to my channel. Uh, my name is Sherwin John Malubay and today we're going to talk about two fascinating topics that have had profound impact on our understanding of human figuration and society. We'll be discussing the Catholic theology of original sin in the lens of figuration theory of Norbert Elias. Both of these subjects were incredibly interesting and thought-provoking, and I'm excited to, de to dive them into them with you. First, uh, let's start with a brief overview of Catholic theology of sin. Sin is as sin is sin as an offense against God and a violation of divine law. There are different types of sin, which includes original sin, which we inherit from the first humans, Adam and Eve, personal sin, which we commit through our own actions. Additionally, this can be categorized as mortal and venial sin. However, I'm not going to delve on that, but rather on original sin. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 399, says that the scripture portrays the tragic consequences of his first disobedience. Adam and Eve immediately lose the grace of original holiness. They become afraid of the God whom they have conceived a distorted image, that of a God jealous of his prerogatives. Moreover, in CCC number 400, the harmony in which they had found themselves, thanks to original justice which is now destroyed, the control of the soul's spiritual faculties over the body is shattered. The union of man and woman becomes subject to tensions. The relation sends forth marked by lust and domination. Harmony with creation is broken. Visible creation has become alien and hostile to man. Because of man, creation is now subject to its bondage to decay. Finally, the consequence explicitly foretold for this disobedience will come true. Man will return to the ground, for out of it he was taken. Death will make its entrance and has taken its entrance into human history. Now at this point, let's take a glimpse on the figuration theory of Norbert Elias. Norbert Elias used various terms to describe and encapsulate his idea of regression sociology. However, the most interesting idea which captured my attention is those two concepts, you know, interdependence and habitus, emphasizing that human beings are not just a person with its singularity but on the plural side of things. He, stred, he stressed that the identity of an individual is highlighted only when it exists within and through the interweaving networks of relationship, which is figuration. The essential relatedness of human beings, said Elias, began with being born as helpless infants, over which we have no control. Underlying all intended interactions of human beings is their unintended interdependence. He emphasized seeing human beings in the plural rather than the singular as part of collectives of groups and networks and stressed that their very identity as unique individuals only existed within and those through those networks or figurations. Now, let's delve deeper onto the main topic what is the relation between Catholic theology of original sin and the figuration theory? I would quote first the Catechism, which has its sublime wisdom regarding original sin. And I quote, CCC number 402. All men are implicated in Adam's sin, as St. Paul affirms. By one man's disobedience, many, that is, all men, were made sinners. Sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. So death spread to all men became all men sinned. The apostle contrasts the universality of sin and death within the universality of salvation in Christ. Then, as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all men, 
one man's act of righteousness leads to acquittal and life for all men. I'd like to further it with the CCC number 404, saying, How did the sin of Adam become the sin of all his descendants? The whole human race is in Adam as one body of one man. By this unity of human race, all men are implicated in Adam's sin, as all are implicated in Christ's justice. Still, the transmission of original sin is a mystery that we cannot fully understand. But we do know by revelation that Adam had received original justice and holiness, not for himself alone, but for all human nature. Um, further, the CCC number 405 states that although it is proper to each individual, original sin does not have the character of a personal fault in any of Adam's descendants. It is a deprivation of original holiness and justice, as I said a while ago. But human nature has not been fully corrupted, but wounded in the net natural powers to it, subject to ignorance, dominion of death, suffering, and inclination to sin, which is called concupiscence. Now, uh, let's try to connect it with figuration theory. Uh, the best example of which is the analogy of John Donne's iconic poem, No Man is an Island. It is stressed there that an island is connected to a larger body, which is continental shelf, volcanic crust, or ocean floor. Therefore, it's not alone. Oh, there's no such a thing as an island. Another example is a tapestry. It helps us in, uh, envision a dynamic interdependence that figurations and visions or signifies. Comparing the social world to a tapestry in progress, with multiple participants as threads contributing to its warp and weft, we can imagine how influence what what's being produced without anyone being able to control or perfectly predict the outcome. Threads end and some patterns cease. Others come together to create entirely new patterns, suggesting a relational process that is emergent, contingent, and creative. The metaphor works in other ways too. The connotation of fibers and threads as the base materials align. Nicely with attention with the biophysical, alluding to ideas in physics about strings as the fundamental staff in the universe. With regarding to the meaning at the social level, it fits without with the notions of the thread of story or spinning a yarn. Just as elaborate tapestry can contain symbols that tell the stories of people, a big picture view of figurational interweaving allows us to trace threads and patterns back in the directions from whence they came to understand how things got to be the way they are and to project forward for insights what's possibly or likely. As a conclusion, uh, there's a good fiction writer by the name of Kim Stanley Robinson explaining the relation of tapestry and figuration theory and accidentally implying the theology of sin as well. And I quote, Make us a thread in tapestry that has unrolled for centuries before us and will unroll for centuries after us. We're midway through the loom. That's the present. And what we do cast the thread in a particular direction. And the picture in the tapestry changes accordingly. End quote. I hope the connection between sin and figuration is now clear. The interweaving of man's figuration does not end on the sociological aspect, but on the spiritual aspect as well. By the virtue of the sacrament of baptism, Catholics believe that they will become part of the church instituted by Christ. Thus, when someone sins, he or she hurts the church as well because he is a member. With that, we are all related and under and brethren within one God. And thus, there you have it. 
a brief overview of Catholic theology of sin in the lens of figuration theory of Norbert Elias. I hope this video has been informative, interesting for you. Please pre feel free to leave a comment below. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video. Bye!